And if you'll open your Bible there to Luke chapter 15, the Gospel of Luke chapter number 15. And what we just sung about is the subject today. I'm speaking on the sinner's friend, the sinner's friend. Luke chapter 15, and follow with me as we read God's Word. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it upon his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. And either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And he said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there he wasted his substance with riotous living. Thank you, and you may be seated. The sinner's friend. Luke chapter 15 is one of the Bible's really golden chapters. If you're a Christian and you've been saved for any period of time, you recognize it as a a very special chapter in God's Word. It contains three of the most famous parables that the Lord Jesus Christ ever gave to us. Notice with me in verse 1, there drew near unto him publicans and sinners. I want to call your attention to that verse for this reason, that the publicans were the tax collectors. They were hated by the people because they were Jews who were working for the Roman government. And the way they made their living was to extort from the people money above and beyond the tax bill. So they would tell the people that you owe the government so much money. Really, the people owed less than that, but they would raise the figure and then they would collect that money. They were scamming. They were skimming the system, if you will, and getting rich at the expense of the people paying their taxes. And so publicans were with Jesus and sinners, and we find that sinners and publicans were drawn to Jesus Christ. And so he was eating with them. That was the allegation of the Pharisees and the scribes here. I would compare the public and center, publicans and sinners to the lame, the poor, the halt, and the blind that we talked about last week when I preached on the Great Supper. The master sent out the servant and said, bring in hither the lame, the poor, the halt, the blind. And now we have the publicans and the sinners. What we're really talking about are the people that are on the margins, the people that are sort of the outcast of society, sort of the dregs of society in one sense of the word. They're people that... um, other people looked down upon because it was some moral failure or some problem in their life. What I want you to notice today, and boy, get hold of this, Christians, particularly Christians who've been saved a long time and sitting in a church and nice, upstanding, moral, and clean people, I want you to know that Jesus, how, I want you to notice how Jesus treated people. And not how he just treated people. 
how he treated the underclass people, how he treated the people out there on the margins that everybody else didn't want much to do with. And the way Jesus treated them, he treated them with kindness. He treated them with dignity. A lot of people who are, we would say, in the underclass of society, they don't get treated with dignity. They get treated like they're not very important. And the Lord Jesus Christ, above everything else in his ministry, he reached out to these people. It was as if he were trying to build up their self-esteem, that he was going an extra mile to show them, look, I accept you. That the society may not think so much of you, but I'll tell you, I accept you. And I want you to know that you're loved of me. So he treated them with kindness, with dignity. There was no partiality with Jesus Christ. Are you partial toward people? Do you treat the guy with the nice-looking suit and the nice car and the good job and the position? Do you treat him differently than you do the guy who appears to be, not have a whole lot, who doesn't have any influence and, and who doesn't have any position in life? Well, I hope you don't. Because if we treated people, if everybody on this, in this country today would treat people like Jesus treated people, we wouldn't have any racism. We wouldn't have any partiality. We wouldn't have any division. We wouldn't have near as much hatred. And often it's said about Christians that we are condescending. We look down on people. Oh, God forbid. I hope that's never said of me. I hope it's never said of our church. I hope it's never said of you. The mark of a mature Christian is to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, and he treated everybody the same. Now, the people criticizing him, verse 2, the scribes and the Pharisees, and they murmured, this man receiveth, you could put there in parentheses after receiveth, he accepts, he accepts people who are sinners, those people out there on the margins, the forgotten people of society. And while they were criticizing him, I'm sure Jesus was thinking, well, I don't know if Jesus thought like this, but I do. They're a bunch of snobs. They're arrogant. They're condescending. They look down on people. They're proud. And I'm sure Jesus noticed that. What I really think he was thinking is, these people are criticizing me and murmuring about me because I'm doing the very thing that I came to do. They're criticizing me for my, for my mission. The reason I came to this earth is to reach the sinners. When we were back in chapter number 5 and verse 32, I called to your attention a wonderful verse of Scripture that's a key verse, really. It said, Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus said, my target group was not the righteous, the self-righteous. It was the people who are sinners. And in Luke 19 and 10, he restated it in this way. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, stop and ponder that. It's a very familiar passage. You've heard it a lot. Stop and, and just camp on that a minute in your mind. I came to seek and to, and to search out and to save the lost, the people that need my touch upon their life. Could a more wonderful thing ever be said about a person than was said about Jesus, that he's the friend of sinners? And that's the mission today, the sinner's friend. I want you to notice with me, number one, that all three parables demonstrate what it is to be lost. This is a par all three of these parables are parables about lostness. Look in verse 4, and you will see the word lose. And then further down, you'll see the word lost. Go to verse 6, and you'll see the last word of the verse is lost. If you go to verse 8, you'll find lose. Again, if she lose one piece. And at the end of verse 9, the very, worst, uh, the very last word is what? It's lost. 
These are parables about lostness. If you look down in verse number 24, you will see the father say, my son was lost, but now he is found. And if you go to the end verse of the chapter, he was lost and he is found. It's a chapter about lost people and about lost things. In verse 4, it uses the word lose. In verse 8, you see the word lose. So it's about lost things, things that are lost and need to be found. I'm old, and I'm going to show my age here, I guess. But when I was a kid, my mother and dad used to subscribe to the Reader's Digest. Does anybody remember the Reader's Digest? <laughs> and every year at Christmas, they would give me a copy of the Reader's Digest, and I'd read every article in it every month. I loved the Reader's Digest. And they quit publishing it when America could no longer read. But back in those days, people read, and the Reader's Digest was in everybody's home, I guess, at that time. And the Reader's Digest had a contest about finding the most unique words in various categories. Like, what is the best word in the English language? And what is the most frightening word in the English language? And in the contest, they asked, what is the saddest word in the English language? And they were offering, I don't know, some token amount, $100 or something. I guess in those days, a pretty good amount. But $100 in each of these categories, and people would send in their entries, hoping they might win their $100. And there was a winner in the category. What is the saddest word in the English language? You probably figured out where I'm going. It was L-O-S-T, lost. Think about that word. How sad. Things that are lost. And of all the words that the Scripture uses to describe people away from God, this is probably the most appropriate and descriptive. They are lost. The best description of a sinner is one word, lost. People without Christ, they're lost to their purpose, just like the sheep. The purpose of a sheep is he grows wool, he provides meat, he provides milk. He has a number of functions, but he, he's lost to his purpose when he's out there in the wilderness. He's not of any value to anybody. And a silver coin, oh, you can take a silver coin and in exchange you can get just about anything. You could purchase money, or you could purchase food, you could purchase clothing, you could pay your rent or your house payment with silver. But a silver coin is lost. It's rolled under the furniture and is in the darkness and is in the dirt. Well, it has no purchasing power. It's worth nothing until you find it. So lost, lostness describes a person who are lost to their very purpose in life. And then if you will notice something else, when people are lost, when they're truly lost, I mean really lost out there, and they are fully and finally lost, they can't find their way back home. They're helpless to find the way back, so they need to be rescued. There has to be somebody else who comes and who acts on their behalf if they're truly and, and finally lost. And so the sheep needs a rescuer. The coin needs somebody to search and find it. And Jesus Christ uses this kind of terminology to tell us about lostness. I had a friend for many years. He's passed away now. He used to come here. He was a church consultant. He would help us in our planning, particularly for this building and various things here. His name was Ron Lewis. And Ron used to use a phrase that I've never forgotten. He talked about, he said, the book of Luke is full of a search theology. Now think of those two words, a search theology. And he meant by that that in the book of Luke, people are always searching for lost things. There are things there 
And so here's a boy who goes away, and there's a search for him. Here's a coin. Here is a sheep. Here are people of various descriptions, and always it is the Lord who is pursuing them. You know, we don't seek for God. Most of us were not looking for the Lord. We were not worried about our salvation. And then the Lord Jesus Christ came and He sought for us. And the Holy Spirit wrought conviction in our hearts. We read a book. Somebody witnessed to us. But we weren't looking for the Lord. Sinners are not even conscious of their lostness in most cases until somebody comes and the Lord uses them to remind us, to remind us of the need that we have in our life. Here in verses 4 through 7, we have this lost sheep. And there's a shepherd who goes searching for the sheep. The sheep wouldn't be of any consequence to us all these years later, except that there was a shepherd who cared about that sheep, and he went after that sheep, and he searched for it. Notice that sheep get lost naturally. It is the nature of sheep to wander away. And I've been in those areas of Europe and in the Holy Land and even in the United States where you have great herds of sheep, and there's always the shepherds, one or maybe several, and they are always watching that herd because that sheep can wander off, and they have no sense of direction. I'm told that they will never be able to find their way back to the, ho- to the fold or to their home, and so sheep are lost naturally. And people are lost naturally. People stray. It is their nature to stray away from the Lord. And they wander and they can't return. Another thing about the sheep, it says he wandered into the wilderness. Notice where he wandered. And the Bible teaches that the world is like uh, a wilderness in a spiritual sense. And so this sheep has wandered away, and he's in danger. In the time of our Lord here, there were, there were lions uh, very plentifully in the land of Israel, and there were cliffs that he could fall over. There were briar patches that were so thick he would get hung up in his wool, and he couldn't get away, and he would starve to death. He would die in a matter of hours. There are all kinds of threats and dangers out there that the sheep is unaware of, and he wanders off, and he's not thinking of the danger. He's wandering away. If somebody doesn't come and search for him, he will never find his way back home. And then in verses 8 through 10, we have the lost coin. The Bible says it's silver. The coin is unconscious. It is a thing. It's not living. It is less conscious even than the the sheep was. The coin is not aware of where it is or that it's even lost, but it's lost. It's lost through no fault of its own. You see, uh, the sheep wanders off. He, 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 in whatever way a, a sheep makes decisions, the sheep decides to wander. But the coin didn't decide. He's lost through no fault of his own. The coin is there, lost in the darkness, forces beyond his control. The woman or some member of the family dropped the coin. It rolled into the darkness. Now it's back in some obscure place. It's lost in the dirt as well as the darkness. And the coin lies there unconscious that it's even lost. Like us. The coin has the image of the king upon it. It was made for a higher and a better purpose, but it's not serving that purpose because it's lost. The coin, in fact, even though it's silver, has no value until it's found. A coin lying there, hidden away in the dark, unknown to its owner, it can't purchase anything. It has no value, just like a sinner has no value as to the purpose for which God created them until that sinner is rescued and brought home. And then in verses 11 through 32, it's a long parable. I didn't read the entire passage because I plan to speak on it in the future. 
And I just wanted to introduce it this morning. But the son is willfully lost. The sheep is lost by nature. The coin is unaware that it's even lost. But the sheep is lost, or the son is lost willfully. The son is living at home. He has every reason to be a happy boy. He is, he's in a home where there's plenty. He's loved by his father. And he gets, as we say, this wild hair. He has to go out into the world. And he's unaware of the dangers that are in that world, just like that sheep is. And this son intentionally, willfully, deliberately chooses to leave the father and go out into the wilderness of the world. He knew the way back home. He could have gone back home. He knows the path, but he refuses to go because there's some other motivations in his life. He would rather go out there for the good times and the partying and the fun that he thinks he's going to have. And he has it for a while. Oh, yeah. He, don't, don't believe that there's no pleasure in sin. I hear people, oh, there's no pleasure in sin. Well, you haven't sinned much. But I tell you, there's pleasure in sin. Of course there is, but it's temporary pleasure. And it'll pass. And before long, this guy spent all of his money, and now all of his fair-weather friends have left him. And where does he find himself? The worst place on the planet for a Jewish boy, feeding the hogs. Down here in the hog pen, in the mire and in the filth. And he finds himself so lost that now he doesn't even know who he is. He's completely lost his purpose that God gave him in his life. I want you to notice something else about the three parables. The three parables not only demonstrate what it is to be lost, they demonstrate the love of God for us, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for sinners. You know, we who are Christians and regular churchgoers, it can happen to us that after a while we're not moved and stirred in our hearts by the love of God. When you first get saved in all probability and you heard a sermon on the love of God and Christ being nailed to the cross and what he went through for you, it might have moved you to tears. But the problem we have is that some of us have been saved for so long and we've heard a hundred sermons now on the love of God. What can I say about the love of God that you've not heard a hundred times? But don't let your heart become calloused and insensitive to the love of God in your life, my friend. The mark of a backslider, may I repeat that strongly, the mark of a backslider is a person who the love of God no longer stirs their heart and means anything to them. And in all of these parables, you see God's love demonstrated. First, I want you to notice with me, I'm going to give you four things about the love of God. First, it is an active love. The shepherd counted the sheep. One of them is missing. He goes out into the wilderness. He faces the dangers of the darkness and the storms and the wild animals out there. He is active. He gets up and he leaves the fold and he searches for the sheep until he finds it, the Bible says. And the woman did likewise. In fact, if you'll go down there and look at the woman searching for that piece of silver in verse number 8, it puts in the word diligently. She searches diligently. She is making a thorough, organized search. She's scrutinizing the whole house. She knows it's there somewhere, but she doesn't know exactly where it is. And so she works at finding this piece of silver diligently searching for it. And aren't you thankful today that Jesus didn't just sit in heaven on his royal th throne and look down at the earth and say, those crazy human beings, what a mess they've had made of planet earth down there. But it's not my responsibility to rescue them. They did it for themselves. But our Lord didn't think like that. 
Our Lord loved us. It was an active love. But number two, it was not only an active love, it was a self-denying love. It was a self-sacrificing love. The Bible uses a number of different words for love. One of them is agape, a Greek word that means a love that extends itself, that gives and gives and gives and gives. Many forms of love like Eros and even Phileo, there we, we treat people in a way so they will return the favor. But with agape, it is a love that says, I may never be repaid. The person may not respond in the right way, but it doesn't matter. And I'll give myself, I'll sacrifice myself in order to show my love for that person because without that, they're going to be lost. And so that shepherd braved the wilderness that woman got down on her knees, shined that light in all the dark corners, reached under the furniture, and finally she spots a little gleam of that silver coin, and she rescues it. She finds that lost coin. And Jesus, looking down at you and looking down at me, here's how he described it. He said, no greater love hath a man than this that he will lay down his life for his friends. And that's what he did, a self-sacrificing love. And thirdly, it's a deep love. It's a mighty love. It is a love that is so profound, I can't describe it because in, in the mind of the Lord, it was his purpose. It was his reason to be. You see, Jesus was probably the only person who was ever born who was born to die. The purpose of his coming was to die. Now, you and I die, but that's not our purpose. We're born to live, and we want to live. We want to have a family. We want to work. We want to attain. We want to, we want to have a meaningful life. Jesus wasn't interested in any of that. He had one purpose. He came to die. And why would he do that? Because his love was so deep, so profound, a love that is beyond understanding. Why should he love me so, as the old song says? A love that I can't comprehend, nor can any human brain. A love that is unsearchable, a love that is indescribable. And it's not a love that he got anything out of it. It's a love that he was giving, self-sacrificing himself for human beings. Turn back with me in uh, Luke. A few weeks ago, we talked about this. Go to chapter number 9, if you will, and verse number 51. It says, It came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up meaning his ascension to heaven after his death, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And throughout his life, Jesus had that mission, that purpose. He set his face. A quote from the book of Isaiah where Isaiah said, the Messiah would set his face like a flint, and a flint is the hardest stone. And so Jesus, you can see it on his countenance, on his face. You can see him gripping the muscles in his jaw as he thinks about, I've got one thing I've got to do, one mission I've got to fulfill. I've got to go up to Jerusalem. The time has come, and I've got to go through the agony of the cross, and then three days later, I'm going to resurrect from the grave, and the mission will be over, and I'll go back to heaven to be with my Father. And his love drove him. His love was so profound so deep, so mighty. And the fourth thing about the love of, in all of these parables, it was, it's an unchanging love because God still loves us. Jesus Christ loves you, my friend, whoever you are. He loves you like that shepherd loved that sheep, like that woman cared for that piece of silver like that father loved that son who was down there in the hog pen. I've always had a little bit of a struggle trying to really comprehend God's love for me. 
I know I'm not worthy of self-sacrificing love. I'm not worthy of Calvary, Calvary love. I, I'm, I'm not at all worthy that God should care about me. But when I stop and preach about it and think about it, it stirs my heart. Oh, I want it to stir your heart. Nothing motivates a Christian like the realization, God really loves me. Christ cares about me. Though I can't comprehend that, I can't describe it. He loves me. And he loves me just as much right now. Listen to me. He loves me as much right now as he did when he was hanging on the cross, dying for my sins. Isn't that incredible? He loves me as much right now as he did when he was dying for me on the cross. Norma got on a house cleaning kick. I mean a bad one the other day. She's going through everything in the whole house. And she finds a big box of VHS video. You know, the, you remember those? Another world. And, but we still have one of those players. So she stuck that thing in there. And it was various events at the Florence Baptist Temple. And I was in my office studying. She's watching this video in the den, and I hear her start laughing. And after a while, I mean, she's really laughing. And after a while, she's just cackling. I mean, she's rolling on the floor laughing. I mean, it's so funny. I, I get up and go in there and say, what in the world is going on, honey? Well, she's watching this old video of old Baptist Temple events. At the moment, she was watching a women's event, and the various women were coming up, and they were speaking, but uh, some of them we didn't even recognize 30, 35 years ago. Some of them, of course, have gone away, but what we were talking about is the change in people, and then I saw this fine-looking young preacher, <laughs> dark hair. And I said, who is that guy? I didn't know there was a pastor at this church before me, but there was. And my, how we have changed, church. I can tell you the change has, has been profound. But you know, I know something that never changes. And the cha it never changes the love of God. He still loves me just like he did when he was hanging on the cross. Many times I've stood on the beach and I've looked out over the Atlantic. And you know, every time I look at the ocean, and the same thing when I look up at the moon at night and the stars in the sky, I look at them and I think like this. That's the same moon that Abraham looked at. And that's the same ocean. It hasn't changed a bit. If Jesus had, been, had come to America when he was on earth, and he would have come to Myrtle Beach, and he would have looked eastward, he would have seen the same thing I'm seeing. It's unchanging. Adam looked up there, and that star hasn't moved since Adam. Unchanging. There are not very many things in the world though, that haven't changed. We're changing the world around us is changing. America is changing. Culture is changing. Your friends are changing. Your children are changing. But the love of God is an unchanging love. He loves you just like he did when he was dying for you on the cross. All three of these parables show me something else, too. They show me the joy of salvation. And each one of these parables... When the lost is found, it's a cause of rejoicing. Look in verse 5 and in verse 6, and the shepherd is rejoicing. He's rejoicing. He's found the sheep, and uh, his friends rejoice. He tells them, I've found the sheep. It even says that in heaven there is rejoicing over one lost soul that repenteth. And then you go down to verse 9 and 10. It talks about the woman, and she finds the piece of silver. I can picture it in my imagination. She grabs it. She runs out the door because when we have joy, when we really have a lot of joy in our life, we want to share it with somebody, don't we? 
So she's running across the yard, and she's holding the coin in her hand, and she's saying, look, I found it, I found it. And her neighbors, it says, rejoice with her. They know how badly she's needed that piece of silver. And it says in verse 10 that even the angels in heaven rejoice. And then I go down to verse 23, and the son finally comes home, and the father says, bring in the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and let us be merry. There's joy in the camp. There's joy because lost people being found is a cause of joy in the hearts of God's people in every case. But I also read the text again, and I saw not everybody rejoiced. Up there in verse 2, the Pharisees and scribes were not rejoicing. They were murmuring. Why do people not rejoice when lost people come to Christ? Because they're self-righteous. You see, a self-righteous people don't think it, they don't think it's a big deal that somebody got saved. But people who have the joy of the Lord, oh, they understand it. And there's somebody else doesn't rejoice here. And that's an older brother who is jealous and envious and self-righteous and who says, well, I never went out there, and they never threw a party for me. And he's angry. He's far from rejoicing. Not everybody was rejoicing, but so many were, and particularly those who were seeking for the lost. Let me just throw this little application in here. You know it's a sign of a healthy church when a church has joy. It's a sign of a healthy church when the people of the Lord are rejoicing regardless of the circumstances. We've been through some difficult times with this COVID thing, and it's created other problems, economic problems and business problems and uh, and relational problems and everything else. It's been very difficult for the churches. But, you know, I'm glad that... uh, So many of you, maybe not everybody, I don't know what's in your heart, but so many of you have maintained your your joy. I was standing right down there the other night, and the Bob Jones University Bluegrass Band were here. We enjoyed them, and they're packing up to leave, and one of the little girls, a young lady, came over to me, and she said, Pastor Monroe, I want you to have us back again, will you? And I said, well, yeah, maybe we will be able to do that, and she says, We love coming to this church because it's a happy church. And she said, we go to churches where we don't see any smiles. We don't see, people don't engage with us. They just sit and watch us. But we enjoy coming here because it's a happy church. And I said to her, well, most of us are. (laughs) Most of us are, but there's some people that I'm still working on that first expression of joy in their life, but maybe it's going to come in, in time. You see, when people are found, when the lost are found, that means the soul has been rescued from the clutches of Satan. Why wouldn't we rejoice? When a soul is, a lost soul is found, That means that the future population of heaven has grown. It's been enlarged. When a lost person is found, there's more salt and there's more light now in the world than there was yesterday. And when a lost person is found, the kingdom of God has been expanded. God's people should be a rejoicing people. We have sadness in our life. Here's a lady that yesterday, I held the funeral for her husband, and we buried him. And sure, there's tears, there's sadness, but on the other hand, there's hope. There's a resurrection day. He is in heaven to be in the presence of the Lord eternally. We'll see him again. So even in the midst of our tears, folks, there's a reason for God's people to have joy. In fact, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Second dimension of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. I hope you have the Lord's joy in your heart today. Nothing draws people to church like being around a group of people who are joyful. 
I say it again, nothing draws people to a church more than when they can come and sense that the people here have something that the people of the world don't have, and that something is the joy of the Lord Jesus. And lastly, these three parables all remind me of the need of repentance. All of them mention repentance. If you look in verse 7 and verse 10, you'll see the word repent. If you look in verse 17 and 18, you'll see the word repent. Or, for example, in verse 18, that prodigal son says, I will arise and go to be with my father. And then it says in a previous verse there, he came to himself. Is there a better description of repentance than he came to himself? Repentance, as I've told you, is to change the mind about sin. The prodigal did that. To change the mind about yourself and to change your mind about Christ, that he is the Savior of the world and I'm coming to him. The year was 1915, and there was a Baptist evangelist in Scotland his name was John Harper. And on April, in the middle of April of that year, he bought a ticket on a ship that was going to sail its maiden voyage. It was called the Titanic. John Harper had become very well known as a preacher in Europe, really the outstanding Baptist preacher in all of Scotland. And he was coming to America. His destination was Chicago. He was going to preach at the famous Moody Church, still exists today. And they had asked him to come and fill the pulpit for the next three months to hold a revival and to preach on Sundays for the next 90 days. He was a widower. His wife had died just a year or two before this. He had a little six-year-old girl. And to help him out with the care of the little girl while he would be in Chicago, he also bought a ticket for his niece, who was about 14 or 15 years old. She was going to babysit and company with his little girl while he was busy doing his ministry in Chicago. And the three of them boarded the Titanic, not knowing what lay ahead of them. And it hit the iceberg, as you well know, and ripped open the ship for half of its distance. Soon it became apparent that they were in an emergency and they began to drop the lifeboats down to the water. John Harper took his little girl and his niece. And he led them to the lifeboats, made sure they were going to be safe, got them some blankets and things. The attendant said, you can stay because the record shows that you're a widower. You're the sole supporter, your little daughter and he said, no, I can't. And he left them there in the lifeboat, and he went back to the decks of the ship where people were crying out in panic. And he began to go from person to person. An eyewitness survivor said he was passionate. It was like he was almost running from person to person. He would even put his hands on them and get their attention. He would say, are you saved? And if they said no, he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Bible says you will be saved. Do that right now. And then he wouldn't even wait. He would go to the next one. He was frantically going about trying to grab every person he could and tell them, look, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ if you're not sure of heaven, if you're not sure you're saved. And he was going from person to person to person. There was a young man that he said to him, are you saved? Do you know that you're going to heaven? And the young man said, no, I, I don't know that. And John Harper pulled off his life vest and handed it to him and said, you're going to need this more than I do. And the boat began to slip beneath the surface of the water. And John Harper, that evangelist, dove in because all the lifeboats had left and they were full. He held on to a piece of wood, a big piece of debris, a log or something, timber that was floating that had broken off of the ship. And he held on to it and he paddled and the people were in the water thrashing about in panic. And until the hypothermia set in and killed him, he went from person to person to person. Same thing every time. 
Are you saved? Do you know you're going to heaven? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And then to the next one. Four years later in Ontario, Canada, there was a reunion of the survivors. And there was a man who stood to give his testimony of his survival. And he said, John Harper came up to me holding on to that log. And he said, are you saved? And I said, no. And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the man testified how he remembered vacation Bible school and Sunday school and going to church in his life. And, and he, he prayed to receive Christ. And he was rescued. He said, but John Harper, just a few moments after he spoke to me, the hypothermia had gotten him, and he slipped beneath, beneath the water, two and a half miles deep water. They never found him. He died that day. And he said, but I was John Harper's last convert. You see, he realized he was lost. And because he knew he was lost, it was possible for him to be saved. Until people know they're lost, they are not going to be able to be saved. In Liverpool, England, it was called the office of the Great White Star Line. The Great White Star Line owned many ships that sailed the waters of the whole world. And in those days, they didn't have the sophisticated communication that you and I are familiar with. And so they bought a large, large chalkboard, several feet long. And there were two columns on the chalkboard. They set it up on the sidewalk so people could come up and check on their relatives and friends. And over here on one side, there was a column known to be saved and a listing of the names of all the people that had been rescued. And on this side, another column, known to be lost, and the names of all of them that they knew had not been rescued and had died. Known to be saved, known to be lost. Which column would your name be in today? Bow your head and stand to your feet with me, if you will, please. 